How's it going everybody? I'm Josh KI6NAZ. We are quickly approaching the end of the technician class question pool. So hopefully you've made this journey with me or even better, you went and took some practice tests at hamstudy.org and it's told you the sub elements that you need the most help on. Hopefully these videos are helping you. If you are watching this, there is a link in the description to a playlist that has individual videos for every sub element. So you can rewatch the ones that you need to, to help you get where you need to be going. A big congratulations on taking the first step into getting your amateur radio license. I am looking forward to hearing you out on the bands. Hopefully we can make a contact together at some point. Let's get started. We'll go right into this. This one is a shorter section. There's only 12 questions, but it's a good one. It's on antenna and feed lines. Probably, I'd say, a lot of the YouTubers. We really like antennas and, and feed lines. So here we go. Alpha 1, what is a beam antenna? And it is C, an antenna that concentrates signals in one direction. A beam antenna most resembles like a flashlight where you point it in one direction, you kind of get a circle that shoots light out in one direction. It's concentrating that light. If that was a radio, it would be RF coming out of the end of that antenna. And yeah, there's usually a front and a back and a side, a left side, right side to a beam antenna, that kind of thing. So they're great, they're very helpful for lots of situations. Alpha zero two, which of the following describes a type of antenna loading? And it is A, electrically lengthening by inserting inductors in radiating elements. Did you get all that? So what's an inductor? We talked about it in the early sub-elements. It's a coil of wire. Well, if I had a car and I wanted to get on 40 meters, I would need a really long vertical antenna to the point that I would run into everything and I'd get it caught on an electrical line and kill myself. So what do we do to get around that? We add an inductor. What's a name? another name for an inductor? A coil of wire to shorten physically the antenna. But the length of the antenna is still full length. And that's what we usually do for a lot of mobile applications or portable applications. Alpha 03, which of the following describes a simple dipole oriented parallel to the Earth's surface? That is B, a horizontally polarized antenna. So you might be asking, well, what if we turn it vertically? Well, now it's vertically polarized. Alpha 04, what is a disadvantage of the short flexible antenna supplied with most handheld ham radio transceivers compared to a full sized quarter wave antenna? This would be a rubber duck antenna, the rubber stubby antenna that comes on most handhelds. We call them rubber duck antennas. They are A, less efficient or it has low efficiency. Upgrading your antenna is always one of the first things you should do on a handheld radio. If you are considering upgrading, I would take the link in the description to go check out the Signal Stuff Signal Stick. Good news, the way that hamstudy.org remains free is by selling the Signal Stuff Signal Stick. The proceeds from that antenna sales goes directly to support the life and running of hamstudy.org. So one of the better antennas out there for sure and definitely well priced and a good performer. So check them out. Alpha 05, which of the following increases the resonant frequency of a dipole antenna? So increases the resonant frequency. And the answer is C, shortening it. Very important concept here. A dipole is a dipole is a dipole. Where is it, right? So coax has a pin and a shield. Just think of that as two wires. The pin is the positive, the shield is the negative. Well, if we just take that, those two leads and add equal wires on both sides, that is now a dipole antenna. And we would use something like an antenna analyzer to snip ends of the wires off to get that frequency shorter, to shorten the frequency that it is resonant on. So we always cut the antennas longer than they should be. And then we use devices like antenna analyzers to snip it in to exactly where we want it to be. So shortening always increases the resonant frequency. So we use that to line it up where we want it to be. Alpha 06, which of the following types of antenna offer the greatest gain? 
And the answer here is Yagi. This question really should say Yagi dash Uda because Yagi and Uda were two individuals that developed the Yagi Uda antenna. So um, yeah, shout out to Yagi Uda. The answer is Yagi. It is a directional antenna, but now you know. Alpha 07, what is a disadvantage of using a handheld VHF transceiver with a flexible antenna inside a vehicle? A, signal strength is reduced due to the shielding effect of the vehicle. Yeah, they're, you're semi-wrapped in metal. That's going to that's gonna kill some of your signal. So what's the best thing you can do? Throw a mag mount on the roof of the car and then just use a, an antenna adapter to be able to connect to your radio. Alpha 08, what is the appropriate length in inches of a quarter wavelength vertical antenna for 146 megahertz? And the answer is 19. So again, if you took uh, 300 and divided it by 146, being the megahertz that you wanted to transmit on, you'd get something a little north of two. And 146 is in the two meter band. And then you could use a calculator or whatever math to convert from meters to inches. And that would get you um, basically where you are at with that antenna. Or you could just have a metric tape measure and just measure out the wire that way. Approximate is an important word here because antenna lengths will vary depending on where you you are geographically and how you have it deployed. Uh, antennas are affected by many things around it, including ground composition. So just keep in mind, when we say approximate, we really do mean it. We expect you to literally cut the antenna too long and then kind of snip it into, into place over time, right, until you get it just right. Alpha 09, what is the approximate length in inches of a half wavelength six meter dipole antenna? And that is C, 112 inches. Of course, there is an approximate calculation for inches as well. You can take 468 divided by the frequency, which will get you close to the length in inches as well. Again, close, approximate. We're using uh, soft words here to avoid giving you a hard answer because you generally want it to be a little longer and then you know, walk it in, as I like to say. An important thing to understand, alpha 10, in which direction does a half wave dipole antenna radiate the strongest signal? The answer is D, broadside of the antenna. Remember, what is a dipole? It's two equal length wires coming off the feed point of the antenna. Well, the tips, the ends of those wires, those are like null points. They don't really radiate that much RF. Well, where is the RF coming from? Well, it's coming from the broad side of those two lengths of wire. So if you rotated it like this, so one end is over here and one end is over here, most of the RF is going out and up and all around the broad side of the antenna. If you were to take this antenna and put it in the middle of free space, like way high up there, and you had some kind of capability to model this antenna. There are software applications that do this. And you made a model, like a visual representation of that propagation of that antenna. It would look like a big sky donut, a big donut in the air. So that's kind of what it looks like. That's important to understand, though. Alpha 11, what is antenna gain? We've seen this in different forms in other sub-elements, but it's C, the increase in signal strength in a specified direction compared to a reference antenna. Um, reference antennas can be verticals or dipoles or whatever, but um, we're talking about doing something to the antenna to increase the intensity of the power, the signal strength, in one specific direction and kind of nulling the sides a bit or lessening the signal strength on the sides. That's gain. Alpha 12, the last in section A. What is an advantage of a 5 8 wavelength whip antenna for VHF or UHF mobile service? And it is A, it has more gain than a quarter wavelength antenna. So a lot of times um, the handheld antennas that go, you know, on your on your HT as we call it, your handheld radio, those are quarter wavelength antennas, but a five eighths more gain. So kind of a better performer in some cases. We're into section B of sub element nine. Last one. Here we go. Bravo zero one. What is the benefit of low 
SWR, and again, that is an acronym for standing wave ratio, and it is B, reduced signal loss. That is always good, also potentially less damage to your radio, but that's something you're just gonna have to remember. Bravo Zero Two, what is the most common impedance of coaxial cable used in amateur radio? It is B, 50 ohms. You generally want coax cable that is 50 ohms. Not 75, not the stuff that comes with your television, nothing like that, you want, you want 50 ohms. Bravo Zero Three, why is coaxial cable the most common feed line for amateur radio antenna systems? And the answer is, it is easy to use and requires few special installation considerations. The other thing we use, albeit more rarely, is what we call twin lead or window line. This is literally a wire here and a wire here separated by a plastic divider that keeps it equally spaced. This was used for quite a long time before the invention of coax. Some people still use it. It is uh, less affected by losses than coax is, and it's actually pretty fun to work with. But we use coax now for pretty much everything because of the convenience factor for it, particularly in routing it through our homes, up through the buildings and all that stuff. Bravo Zero Four, what is the major function of an antenna tuner? And in parentheses, antenna coupler. Sometimes this is also called a trans match. And it is to A, it matches the antenna system impedance to the transceiver's output impedance. That is the whole point. We want those antennas to match the transceiver as much as possible. And a tuner kind of helps things out. It softens that SWR curve a bit for the transceiver. Very specifically, we need to stop and have a, have a little chat here. An antenna tuner is kind of a bad name. It's not tuning the antenna. It does nothing to your antenna. The antenna remains the same. What the antenna tuner is doing is making your transceiver happy. It's making your, sure that your transceiver doesn't uh, get damaged finals, like we've talked about in other sub elements. It makes sure that everybody's happy on the radio side of the house. The antenna could be a piece of trash. And in fact, go look at my Christmas light antenna. I used a tuner to be able to make that work because it wouldn't work any other way. So sometimes they're needed, but a lot of times resonant antennas are the best. So keep that in mind. B, Bravo 05, what happens as the frequency of a signal in coaxial cable is increased? D, the losses increase. This is just a universal constant. As you increase the frequency of your transmissions, you will incur more losses on your coax. That's why having a very good coax as you get higher in frequencies like UHF and up becomes vital. Bravo 06, which of the following RF connector type is most suitable for frequencies above 400 megahertz? And the only answer here is B, type N. Type N connectors are specifically designed to be able to be better at higher frequency work. That's why you see it on most coaxes that are used for microwaves and the north side of the UHF space. Bravo 07, which of the following is true of the PL259 coax connector, which is the common connector that you see on mobile ham radios and uh, base station HF radios. And it is C, they are commonly used at HF and VHF frequencies. Yes, that is all true. Once you get to UHF, then you're back to type N. Bravo 08, which of the following is a source of loss in coaxial feed line? And the answer is D, all of these choices are correct water intrusion into coaxial connectors, high SWR, and C, multiple connectors in the line. Uh, any of those things will add to losses in your coax feed line. Bravo 09, what can cause erratic changes in your SWR? That is an acronym for standing wave ratio. It is B, loose connections in the antenna or the feed line. If you experience issues with your antenna or your radio or anything like that where things just keep changing on you, it's very likely that you have a connector issue and need to go tighten things up. Bravo 10, what is the electrical difference between RG58 and RG213 coaxial cable? And the answer is C, RG213 cable has less loss at a given frequency. 
Again, you're gonna pay more for that privilege. So as you step up to better, more expensive coax, you expect that the losses at any particular frequency to be less. B11, which of the following types of feed line has the lowest loss at VHF and UHF? And it is C, air insulated hard line. This is expensive stuff. A lot of people don't run this. Some do, uh, but you don't often see it, but that is the answer. Bravo 12, what is standing wave ratio in parentheses SWR? A, a measure of how well a load is matched to a transmission line. That's it. All right, so that was sub element nine. We have one more sub elements to go. Hopefully you are following along taking your hamstudy.org practice test, which will help tell you what sub elements you need help in. And then you can jump right into the playlist that is in the description and find those sub elements that I've put together there easily for you to follow along and study. Again, congratulations on considering picking up amateur radio as a hobby. It is a wonderful community of people and just a tremendous amount of fun. So if you'd like to learn more, check out my channel. Please subscribe. Go to that channel. Hit the playlist for Are You New to Ham Radio? Click here, and there should be all kinds of interesting videos that will help you get started. I'm Josh, KI6NAZ. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll talk to you later. See ya.